Welcome, everybody. Today, we're talking about a college for everyone. Tips for finding a right fit college for your child, even if your student has average grades. Well, you're luck today. I have a special guest with me today, um, Kristen Landis. Kristen is a college consultant here with us at Educational Connections. She has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Richmond, and she has a law degree from Emory University in Atlanta. Now, um, prior to coming to Educational Connections, Kristen worked at UVA for over 11 years, where she evaluated over 10,000 applications on um, in-state students, out-of-state students, and international candidates. So Kristen, so glad you're here today. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Anna. I'm happy to be here. You know, so much has changed. Um, definitely in the last three years, we've seen drastic changes when it comes to college admissions. Tell us a little bit about this new landscape. Absolutely. I mean, I think this webinar is super timely because right now, I'm sure many of the people uh, listening today and watching have had their students coming home saying, oh my gosh, you won't believe Joey who has this GPA and these SATs didn't get into XYZ school. Or maybe parents are talking to other parents and they're saying, oh, did you hear about Susie who didn't get into this school with these different credentials? So I think this is super timely that we're doing this today. And you're right, Anne, the college landscape has changed um, significantly basically since the pandemic. Um, first, is, first of all, I want to say that college admissions is not an exact science by any stretch of the imagination. There are so many factors that go into an acceptance. So I just want people to understand that um, first. But yes, what has changed in the landscape? It's since the pandemic, we've just seen a, a significant increase in the number of applications. If we look at just Virginia alone, um, at UVA this past year, all the figures are out now that we're kind of at the end of the season. Um, they had a 10% increase in applications since last year. When I started with UVA back in 2010, uh, we had about 24,000 applications. When I left, I mean, this past year, they had 55,000 applications. Virginia Tech saw a 4.5% increase in applications this past year. But since 2018, they've seen a 47% percent increase. And JMU saw a 30% increase in early um, applicants this year. So definitely an increase. So what does that mean, actually? That means um, more applications equates to lower acceptance rates, where Ivies and highly competitive schools, maybe five or six years ago, were having 10% acceptance rates. You're now looking at three or 4% acceptance rates. Schools, um, that are also selective that we're having 30% acceptance rates are now hovering down in that 10 to 15% acceptance rates. And why is that happening? Well, one of the reasons is this test optional landscape that we're living in. With the pandemic, um, more students cast a wider net applying to more schools since they weren't um, restricted by having to submit scores. Colleges have gotten a lot better at promoting themselves online, having virtual tours, having lots of resources available so students can learn more about a school without actually having to go visit it before they apply to it. And one of the other things that we've seen um, in the last couple of years since the pandemic is colleges are making a much more um, cognizant effort to attract underrepresented students, students from um, urban areas, first gen students, JMU alone saw an increase of 56% in um, first gens in their applicant pool this past year. So, however, although we're seeing a low acceptance rates, that does not equate to the quality of school. And acceptance rates are kind of hyped up and maybe, Kristen, too much so because they're not really the thing that we want to think about when we think about a good fit school for our kids. Absolutely, because acceptance rates do not equate, like I said, to how good a school is or how how um, what kind of experience your student is going to have at that school. Acceptance rates truly measure the school's selectivity, not necessarily their, their worth. Acceptance rates literally mean the number of accepted students divided by the total number of applicants. The lower the rate, the more applicants that they receive than they actually have spots for. So people um, have that misconception of saying, well, if a school has a high acceptance rate, then it must not be a good school. 
or they must not have um, you know, good opportunities available to my student. And that is absolutely not the case. There's over 2000 universities in this country and more, um, more colleges accept two thirds of the students that apply. So there are lots of, of high quality schools out there that people can apply to that have higher acceptance rates. University of Colorado at Boulder, excellent school, has a 79% acceptance rate. West Virginia University, tons of opportunities at West Virginia, an 85% acceptance rate. Drexel University, a 74% acceptance rate. So acceptance rates really shouldn't be something that people focus on. So then you say to yourself, well, what should you focus on? Things you should focus on to see what type of academic environment you're going to have is faculty to student ratio, percentage of faculty that have um, the highest degrees that they can in their field, the number of classes that are taught by tenured professors, average class size. These are the factors that go into a student's experience in the classroom. The other thing you want to look at is um, what do those students do once they graduate? What percentage uh, secure jobs right after graduation? How many are accepted to graduate schools? Um, one thing that's really interesting is that of the top 100 corporations out in, this, uh, in the country, of the CEOs of those corporations, 30 of them graduated from Ivy League schools and highly selective schools. The other 70 of them graduated from schools that are excellent schools like Fordham, Auburn, University of Nebraska, Kansas, Texas A&M. So it'd be really, um, you'd really be limiting yourself if you looked just at the uh, acceptance rates, just like you'd be really limiting yourself if you don't look beyond the rankings. <laughs> so let's talk a little uh, bit about rankings then. Yeah, because I see rankings all the time, like according yeah. to US News and World Report, um, exactly. what do those rankings mean and, and should we even consider them? Absolutely. And that's, a, that's an excellent question because rankings are really there more for the college than they are for the student. They truly are an algorithm that includes the selectivity of the schools and the reputations of the schools, as well as acceptance rates and yield rates in their determining. There was a Stanford University study that was done that um, the factors that the U.S. News and World Report consider and other rankings are actually not what parents and students are looking for in a college. Even the editors of U.S. News and World Report said that ranking should only be one criteria that people look at. It shouldn't be something that they focus on. Um, by looking at the rankings of schools, you make the unfortunate consequence of discounting lots of wonderful schools that out, are out there because rankings do not fully evaluate the quality of the student experience at all. So it really comes down to, it sounds like, Kristen, what you're saying is the fit, you know, really a fit between the, the student and the college, not necessarily um, how hard it is to get into that school or whether it's a highly ranked school. Can you talk a little bit about that fit? Absolutely, and it truly is, and if you think about that Lizzo song, it truly is all about the fit. Um, that is something at EC that we focus a tremendous amount on. Yes, you wanna find schools that match your student, that match their you know, GPA and testing if they submit, but we really spend most of our time looking for schools that are that fit your student. And there are a number of different factors that fall into um, what school would fit your student. And first of all, from an academic standpoint, you know, do they offer courses in the areas that your student is interested in? Um, do they give you opportunities to explore other interests? Um, are you looking for more of like a liberal arts um, education, or do you want more of a research-oriented STEM? Those are things that we look at. Right now, I'm meeting with um, a lot of my students trying to help them decide which college to pick. They're in, the, they're in a good position of having a number of acceptances and wanting um, and trying to figure out which would be the best fit for them. So I have one student who's accepted to um, a large university and also to a, a larger university um, more of a research type school and, and one that's more of a liberal arts environment. And so he's really interested in biology, but he's also really interested in Spanish and he think he may want to minor or major in Spanish. So we did a real deep dive into the biology department and the Spanish department of both schools and also the requirements that they have for graduation to see if there would be that academic freedom for him in order to pursue both Spanish and biology. 
I have another student who's actually grappling between four schools, and she is really interested in um, environmental science. So when she applied to colleges, she applied to environmental studies and science programs. Since then, she's decided that she's very, very interested in more of the design, urban planning aspect, um, the sustainability of environmental science. So of those four schools, we did a huge deep dive into each one of them. Two of them were more of a, a traditional environmental science program. One of them was uh, very natural resource focused. And the other one what had a real design architecture component, and it was just organically was the, the right fit for her to go to. So looking at in the, uh, the experience that you have in the classroom, but also that experience outside the classroom, which can be just as important. And so when we look at that, it's, you know, does the school, school offer um, activities and extracurricular things and clubs and opportunities that you're interested in? If you're really interested in running, is there a running club? Or if you're really interested in, um, in reading, is there some sort of, maybe there's a book group that you can join, those types of things that you're looking at for. And then another factor is environment. I mean, I have students who uh, say, I, I don't want to sweat. I want to wear a sweatshirt. I'm like, okay, we'll concentrate on schools in colder climates. It may seem like that's something that you shouldn't factor in when you're thinking about a college, but the, all these things go into your college experience. Um, some people are like, I'm into sports. I want to be able to see my school on TV. Okay, I understand that. We'll factor that into the equation. Looking at the distance from home, those two students I talked about earlier, um, the, the young lady with the four schools, they're all out west. So we spend a tremendous amount of time looking at transportation options. How long will it take her to get to an airport? How many flights are there available for her to get back to Virginia? Then we were also looking, are the dorms open during spring break and fall break if she decided to stay there? Those are important things to consider. Um, housing and food, if you're a picky eater, if you have dietary restrictions. For the young uh, gentleman who wanted to major in biology that I was talking about, he's really interested in living on campus. He wants to have that on-campus living environment. Well, that larger school provides uh, one year of guaranteed housing and maybe not necessarily in the later years, but that smaller school, he has the opportunity to live on all four years. That's important to him. And then the obvious things that people think about social climate, you know, do you want to be in a Greek system? Is it, is, uh, it important to you to have um, be near a city so that you can take advantage of cultural events? Those are all things that we factor in as well as diversity. How diverse is the population? What's the male female ratio? So you want to keep an open mind when you're thinking about schools and all those little things that are that are important to you, factor them into your decision making. And, um, I have to imagine that, you know, kids are, although they're there for um, really the the atmosphere of the school and to make you sure making sure it's a, a really great fit. There is a component of academics that has to also be a fit. And we want to make sure students are successful once they get there. Absolutely. Why is finding support services before you even decide on a school or as you craft your list important to students? Absolutely. I mean, nowadays, so many students um, uh, are in need of support services and every single university in this country is required to have a disability services office, office so they do, but they aren't all created equal. Some of them, um, I have students where you have to requalify every semester to apply for um, testing accommodations or other sort of accommodations, um, academic accommodations. Other schools, uh, once you apply once, it covers you for all four years. Um, there are other schools that offer a much more comprehensive um, accommodation program. The University of Denver, an excellent school that with their learning effectiveness program, it's a student-led holistic environment. They have weekly counselor meetings. They have organizational management, um, consulting, coaching, and they have social skills, building resources. The University of Arizona, another great school through their SALT Center, they offer specialized workshops. They have like special technology and apps that students use who require accommodations. They also have weekly meetings. They have ADHD coaching. So they really, schools really run the gamut in the amount of resources they offer. And that's really important for students who, who are in need of those to do their research and check it out. Also, 
well-being being and mindness is really important nowadays. Looking at the wellness centers that schools offer, the psychological services if you're in need of those. Um, all those things are available for you to research and you, that can help in finding the right fit for you. Kristen, you mentioned lots of schools that um, maybe students haven't thought about. Why is it important for kids to really get out of their comfort zone? I mean, it really is because there's so many schools out there that students don't even think about and um, don't even know about. You hear the same 20 schools on everybody's tongue, and there truly are. If you, if you focus on those schools, you're missing out on so many wonderful opportunities that could be good fits for your student. Um, one area that I also want to touch on to think about is financial aid. I mean, financial aid, um, you know, the cost of a college education in some instances can be real. It's a huge investment and can be quite steep. So when you're looking at schools, um, you, there's two types of aid. There's need-based aid, and then there's merit aid. Um, need-based aid is the one that everybody thinks about with the FAFSA form and, and uh, looking at your household income. But there's also merit aid, which is based on scholarships. Now, highly selective schools don't necessarily offer very much, if at all, merit aid. But other schools do because they're trying to attract students, and those are forms of scholarships. A school like Furman, um, which is in South Carolina, is an excellent small school. 90% of their students have are on some sort of merit aid, and their average award is $26,000 a year. Um, Alabama, 89% of the students are on some sort of aid with an average award of about $10,000 a year. And lastly, I'll just give another example, South Carolina, 89% of the students are on some sort of merit aid at a, an average award of 22000 so a year. So there's lots of wonderful schools out there that offer a tremendous amount of money. 50% or higher of the students are on that type of aid. Miami University in Ohio, a wonderful school people don't necessarily think about. Um, Catholic right here in DC. Worcester Polytech in um, Massachusetts, an excellent STEM school. And Loyola Marymount right here um, close by in, in Maryland, another school. So think about um, with regards to aid is another thing that students should think about. But going back to what you said, Absolutely, Anne. We urge students to think outside the box because there are, you don't want to limit yourself. As we said, there are lots of other schools out there. So let's say hypothetically you're interested in business. Babson College up in Boston, not only is it considered one of the best entrepreneurial schools in the country, but in the world. People don't necessarily think about that. They may be thinking about UPenn or um, their Wharton Undergraduate School, or UVA's Comm School. But there are a lot of wonderful business programs out there. Indiana University, their Kelly School, has an amazing program, as does Michigan State's Eli School. Maybe you're interested in STEM. San Jose State University out in California is right in the middle of the Silicon Valley. They have all those wonderful opportunities with all those tech companies out there. University of Houston, same thing down in Houston, another becoming a really a big tech giant. You have lots of opportunities. Maybe you're interested in musical theater. Not many people know that Elon University, University of Cincinnati and Ithaca College um, all are in the top 10 in musical theater. So you really need to, it just is more examples of doing your research and seeing that there are a lot of schools out there. Don't limit yourself. I love that, Kristen, because, you know, so often when kids come to us, they have a very similar list um, to other kids, and it's often very top heavy. So they have a lot of schools on their list, too many that aren't quite realistic. They're, they're you know, very reach, even though mm -hmm. they may have very average grades. Um, how do you work with kids and helping them to, to really um, take a look at their list, a deep dive into sort through those schools, put them in the right place, and then add new schools that mm -hmm. might be good, better fits. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Anna. A lot of people come because everybody's thinking about those same uh, those same schools on the top of mind, and so they come with lists that are quite top heavy. So we do it like just the things that we've been talking about: a tremendous amount of exploration in what a student is looking for in a college experience and touching on those different areas that we talked about in and out of the classroom to find those fits for them and introduce them to other schools that they may have not thought about before. That's really important. And just because a student may have what's considered average grades does not mean that they're an average individual by any stretch of the imagination. And those are things that we want to elevate and communicate to colleges. And we do that 
through what we call, um, first we want to explore what's unique about a student. Every single student is unique in some way. When I was reading applications at UVA, I would uh, look at a student and say, what is, what is this student's unique voice? What is their perspective? What makes them tick? What are they going to bring to my college environment, both in and out of the classroom? And everyone has something. And so we're just looking for that through the application. And we do that through what we talk about all the time and creating the narrative. So creating the narrative is what it is about that student, um, their unique voice. And we do that through a number of ways. Um, we do that through how they choose to spend their time outside of the classroom, what courses they take, um, through the recommendations, what teachers say about them and other recommenders, and then of course, through the essays. That's where their unique voice comes through. I love that, Kristen, because I think sometimes kids come to us feeling really average, like what is unique about me? I don't even know what I wanna major in. Um, I'm not sure how I'm different than anybody else. Can you talk a little bit about the survey that you also used? I know um, that yep. that is helpful in helping kids realize, wow, I'm really actually through this survey, I'm really great at this skill. And maybe yep. I might want to go in this direction for a major. Absolutely. Um, at EC, we have a program that's called Achieve Works, and we use it with students. Um, and and First of all, right off the bat, I tell students, I'm in my 50s. I still don't know what I do when I grow up. So um, try to alleviate that pressure. It's really hard as a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old to know what you want to do. Um, you know, it seems like it's just a very daunting thing to ask students. And that's why, I mean, high school and college are about exploration. So at EC, through our Achieve Works assessment program, um, which is really just question questionnaires, we try to help students hey, this is an area that you seem to be interested in or an, era, an area that you have talent and aptitude. Maybe we take a class in the summer on this, or maybe you wanna explore this club at your school with regards to this interest that you thought you kind of had, but you weren't 100% sure. So those are things that we do. We do a lot of exploration, conversation, talking, um, and then provide opportunities for students to explore different things to help create and elevate that narrative. I love that, Kristen. I think it always um, helps kids feel really good about themselves when sometimes they come to this process feeling Absolutely. a little bit unsure. And if Kristen can help your child, um, just let us know. Erin Ebert is our director of college counseling, and um, she's worked with me for 13 years, and she can talk to you about your child, um, tell you a little bit about our services, and um, see if um, what we offer would be a good fit for your family. And, and Kristen is available to work with additional students. So Kristen, let's pivot just, oh, and by the way, you can scan this QR code um, to get an appointment with Erin. Um, so let's talk a little bit about kids that do come feeling kind of average. How do they mm -hmm. highlight and maybe um, pivot what they're doing to be more attractive to schools? Sure. So like we were just talking about, let's say um, I've had students come to me. I've had one recently that's really interested in climate change. So we uh, I've been identifying opportunities outside uh, for, for the summer and outside of school that she can pursue um, looking at volunteer opportunities, looking for a um, advocacy program in the summer. There's always things out there that students can take advantage of. Um, that they don't have to always be the, the most selective programs out there. Colleges are looking for interest. They're looking for initiative. That's what they were looking for, some sort of passion. And you don't have to have tons of things. Having one or two things um, is really all they're looking for. So helping students with that. And then when we we're in a situation, so those are the high, things that we want to highlight, but we also want to highlight, like we talked about, there's something unique about every single student, and it's just finding that and highlighting it. And for students who, let's say, hypothetically, they did poorly in Spanish in ninth grade, they got a C. And um, that's where the additional information sec uh, paragraph on the common application becomes very important because sometimes there's reasons behind a poor grade. And that's where we help them discuss you know, what happened in that situation. Or let's say you had a bad semester um, or even a bad year. There are things that in both your essays and in that additional information where we can um, talk about those things and explain why. 
maybe you are a super involved in um, your figure skater and you spend an inordinate amount of time outside of the classroom and don't have as much time to devote to academics. That's something where we would talk about and um, highlight that there's a reason for that because you spend so much time in this other activity you're not, uh, your grades maybe not, maybe not where you would want them to be or where they could potentially be. So those are things where we kind of highlight and pivot. And one thing I think we really want to get across to people today is that it's never too late. Um, if a student has had a, a challenging year, I mean, life happens. We understand that people are human. Um, so showing an upwards grade trajectory is super compelling. Um, you always have senior year too, first semester senior year. For, people don't realize that that first semester, that senior year program is really, really important. You should see your highest rigor in your senior year, seeing an upward trajectory. So let's say a student um, hasn't taken an AP class yet and they're in 11th grade. Why don't you take an AP class in 12th? That will look very good to colleges. Seeing that rigor and program and grade uh, increased trajectory is very, very important. But let's say you're good at English, but you really find math challenging. So take a, you know, stretch your rigor in your English courses and then take your foot off the pedal in math. We understand that, you know, not everyone is great at everything. So highlight those areas that you're talented in um, and, and emphasize those. Um, and then you want to show that outside of the classroom, showing outside enrichment. Um, let's say your grades aren't as great as you'd like them to be. But if you show in the summer you've taken a class, you show initiative that you're you're um, taking the um, you know, you're trying to stretch yourself intellectually. That's really super compelling. Um, and any sort of outside academic interest you have that you can uh, foster and elevate more. Sometimes students say, well, I just like to play video games and everybody puts down video games. I'm always like, what video games do you like to play? And I have students who um, have competed, uh, done competitions with video games. There's nothing wrong with that. Or they attend hackathons. That's fantastic. Um, just showing uh, initiative and really passion in a certain area is really important. So you just want to emphasize what's special about you. And you mentioned, you know, those things are important when grades might not be what a student mm -hmm. wants them to be. Mm -hmm. How can testing, especially in this test optional environment, help the student? Sure. So if you're a student or if you're if you're a student watching, um, if you're a good test taker, promote that. I would definitely highlight that because if you do well on the ACT or the SAT or AP exams, if you're taking AP exams, um, that is like, that's not subjective. That shows aptitude, that shows potential. And for, some, for a lot of schools, they want to accept students that have high testing scores because that, that increases their numbers and their averages that they advertise. So if you're a good test taker, I highly recommend focusing on testing um, and take a test prep class and take the test, the, the SAT or the ACT. And if you don't know if you're a good test taker, um, EC has opportunities that you can take advantage of to figure it out. Yes, that's true, Kristen. Um, we offer virtual mock test dates. They're on Saturday, nine o'clock. Kids can roll out of bed and take a practice SAT or an ACT. In a perfect world, we recommend they take both. We can put them into a concordance table and then tell the student which test is their natural strength. Um, because you really only want to be preparing for one test. Every school in the country accepts both, and no school has a preference. So you really want to practice for the test that is your natural strength. Um, I was just talking to a parent, Kristen, the other day, and, um, and she said, um, I want to get test preparation for my son um, so that he can submit his, these scores because his grades aren't that great. And he's probably, he might be better um, on a test and he can submit them to all the schools. And actually, when you have just kind of average grades, you really, really want to be selective about the schools in which you send your test scores to. Can you talk a little bit about how that can also help your chances? Sure, absolutely. So um, you're, you're really right. And you don't necessarily want to send your, your testing scores to all schools going 
we're very fortunate the internet has a tremendous amount of information and you can see that the schools that you want to apply to, you can see the, um, the students that are accepted and what their scores are. So if your score falls in the 75% or higher for a specific school, then I would submit my score. If your score doesn't, then I wouldn't, wouldn't submit the score because it will help your, it will help your application if you're up in that higher range. But if you're not in that higher range, it will actually hurt your application if you submit your score. And as you said, you can pick and choose which schools you submit your scores to. That's right, because unlike, you know, even five years ago, you own your data. So mm -hmm. it's it's yours. You can submit scores to the schools you want to. And that's why really having a selective approach, especially when you kind of have average grades, is really, really important. And so what we often see is that our kids are submitting their test scores to more of like their safety schools. Or I know, Kristen, you have another word for safety, most likely, oh, I think. Most likely, yeah. <laughs> um, or those framework, sometimes they'll submit them to those middle of the road schools, but maybe not their reach schools. So mm -hmm. there's definitely strategy behind testing. Mm -hmm. um, so we really encourage kids to have a score, you know, take a practice test, we'll send you in the right direction practice for that test, take the test. Most kids take the test twice, sometimes three times, twice is fine usually. Um, and even if you don't use your uh, score all the time, you've got it in your back pocket to use when you want to. And that really can help your application. Mm -hmm. So Krista, there's always a lot swirling around parents' minds. And I think it's just so easy to listen to what other people are saying and and really be worried about what the future holds. Tell us about um, why blocking out all of that noise is important. Absolutely. I mean, we started the webinar uh, with this and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of end it with it as well. And it's really, really hard not to um, listen to all the noise out there. And as your student gets closer and closer to 12th grade and applying to colleges, that noise will just become more and more amplified. Um, that's why we really encourage students to be confident in their own journey. This is their journey, no one else's, um, not their friends, not their parents, and um, be confident in your own unique abilities. And there is truly, and we talk about this all the time, a school for everyone. Uh, where you go to college isn't necessarily going to define how happy or how successful that you're going to be in life. And um, it really is what you make of it. And um, I was actually listening to a podcast the other day, and uh, it was it just seemed a little timely. And I'd love to just share a little bit of the story with you from the, from the podcast. So the podcast is actually uh, 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 from a woman who is one of my sorority sisters. I didn't actually know her very well, but she was one of the officers in the sorority. So I remember seeing her up there. But um, she is a uh, two-time uh, New York Times bestseller author, <laughs> and uh, she has a podcast. So I've been kind of listening a little bit to her over the years. And she was talking about college um, this time of year and that a lot of students are getting accept acceptances, but they're also a ton are getting rejections. And um, if you have a balanced list, the probability is you probably will have one or two rejections because those reach schools are what, what they are, their reaches. Um, so she, her own story is she didn't get into the college that she really wanted to go to. And she cried for a number of days um, until she finally ended up going to where I went to college. But, um, and she talks about how when she went to um, University of Richmond, she got involved in all the activities and really embraced the experience. And it really made her um, a much more enriched and uh, more fulfilled person and really helped her explore who she was. And so she tells this story and I'll just tell it really, really briefly. It's a story about Farmer Joe. And the story goes like this. Uh, Farmer Joe was out uh, working hard in his fields, tending his fields, and he had this prized horse named Big Red. And one day Big Red ran away and news spread across the village that Big Red had run away and neighbors came to him and said, oh my gosh, that's so horrible. You've, you've lost Big Red. And he goes, mm, we'll see. And he went back to work and, and tended his fields. The next day, Big Red came back, but he came back with two other horses. News spread through the village and the village villagers said, wow, you're so lucky. Now you have Big Red and two horses. And he goes, mm, we'll see. And he went back to tend his fields as best he could. Then a week later, his son, Joey, was riding one of those new horses and he fell off the horse and broke his arm. 
news spread through the village and they're like, oh my gosh, that's so tragic. That's horrible. And Farmer Joe said, hmm, we'll see. And he went back to tending his fields as best he could. A week later, the army came through recruiting um, young men for war. And little Joey couldn't, well, he wasn't really that little because he could go to, go to war, but um, couldn't, couldn't be recruited because he had broken his arm. News spread through the villages and villagers. And they said, oh my gosh, you're so lucky that Joey didn't have to go to, the, go to war. And he said, hmm, we'll see. And he went back and he tended his field as best he could. So this, the moral of that, that joke, or it's not a joke, that story is that um, you never know in life when something happens, whether it's going to be a good thing or a bad thing. And the only factor that you can control is you. And as I said earlier, you know, it's college is what you make of it. It's what your student makes of it. And so that is really kind of the moral. She had that uh, same experience. So you or your student is their own good news. And so they should go out, work hard and tend their fields as best they could. And that will be enough. I love that, Kristen. Thank you for sharing that. It, it sure. kind of um, put things in perspective for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, and thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I love talking about college admissions and you're the absolute best. And thank you for all your amazing work with your kids um, as they're all getting their acceptances back. And, and I know you're starting with, um, I know you've been working with younger students as well. You got a lot of juniors on your plate. And um, how young do you take kids? Um, I have a number of ninth graders right now. And so we're doing a lot of that, that work that we talked earlier about exploration, um, seeing what they may be interested in. And I find that super exciting, being able to go out and explore a new thing or, and have that aha moment of, hey, I'm kind of interested in this. So yeah, I start with ninth graders and work all the way up through college admissions, the applications. Terrific. Thank you, Kristen. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to mention to everybody before we go to Q&A, and by the way, if you have a question, go ahead and pop it in the Q&A chat right now, or the chat, sorry. Um, we have another webinar coming up. Kristen's talk today was part of our series. Our next one is Supercharge Your Students' Executive Function Skills for a Successful End of the Year and um, for the summer too. And that's on April 19th. That's with Kathy Gold. Um, she is our executive function specialist from one to two o'clock in the afternoon. All right, so let's shift over to our Q&A. And we have so many questions. I see that we have 37 um, messages here. So I'm, I may have, if I covered yours and you asked a question early on as we were coming in, um, uh, we, I might skip yours. And if I have time, I'll go back to it. So Kate says um, her daughter has more reach schools on her list than she's likely to get in. And as I mentioned earlier, we see this a lot with kids. Um, so oftentimes, though, the parent agrees with it. In this case, it sounds like maybe the parent is kind of concerned, um, but the student not so much. How do you deal with that kind of situation, Kristen? Sure. Um, I think it's really important because you don't want a student to um, feel that, they, that they're not good enough or have their confidence be shaken. So first of all, the first thing I say to students is any school that has about a 15% or lower acceptance rate is a reach for everyone, not, not just you, everyone. It's a reach. And so then we explore um, more thoroughly and provide her or him with options. Um, schools that we feel that fall more in their target range and then ones that we think will be most likely for them to get into. All of it under the lens of what is school would be a good fit for them, because that truly is the most thing that we're most concerned and what we think is most important. Kristen, on the other end of that spectrum, Lynn has a son that's really, really worried. He's just not going to get in anywhere. Yeah, I mean, that happens. I, I, I can appreciate that because, again, you're hearing all this noise and you think everything's so competitive. And that's another thing that we say to students. There truly is a college for everyone. And it's just finding those that are out there for you. And that's something that we help students with. Um, somebody else mentioned that they, they're they worried about their child with a learning disability in college. And I know you touched about, you talked about schools that support kids well. Mm -hmm. What are some things that parents should be thinking about now as they craft a list or what, what how do you help your kids that might have mm -hmm. a 504 an IEP or a diagnosis, but they don't have any support 
um, formal supports in high school? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, we do a, a tremendous amount of research into the support services that are offered at schools. I have some students who are um, on the spectrum. I have one in particular where it was very important to find particular housing for them. So we dove deep into the schools that he ended up applying to, to make sure they had the type of housing that he would feel comfortable with. Um, and so it's really doing the research and seeing uh, that the schools are there that can support the student. If a student um, does not have a formal IEP or um, something, a diagnosis from the, from the school, it is difficult to get services, testing accommodations on a college level without some sort of report from a professional, um, from with a professional evaluation. So they would need that in order to get certain accommodations at almost most schools. Thank you so much for that. Um, somebody mentioned an unmotivated student and we've had these kids that, you know, sometimes they're unsure about what, if they want to go to college or not, but um, the parent is concerned that they might be immature. And, you know, if the, if they just went in that direction and it didn't apply anywhere, as time went on, the, the child would come to realize you made a mistake. Mm -hmm. How do you help kids that may be struggling with motivation? Um, they're not sure if college is for them, yet they want something in their back pocket. Sure, absolutely. I mean, sometimes uh, what parents th or, or others that may think is a lack of motivation is truly fear. They're afraid that they're going that they're not good enough or they're going to be rejected. Um, and so I had a student this past uh, who came to me in 11th grade this past summer, didn't think she wanted to go to college. And that's OK. I mean, there are tradition, there are non-traditional ways of getting to college. She knew she wanted to do it eventually, but she didn't know how. So we initially started out with, you know, how about we explore junior colleges or community colleges or maybe let's just apply to a couple four years colleges. And we were really, really um, thoughtful about this, the few schools that she ended up applying to, all with the idea that she thought she would if she even went to college, she'd want to do a gap year. And so we put a bunch of irons in the fire because where you are, where your student is in ninth, 10th, 11th, they may not be when the time comes when they graduate from high school. So you want them to have options. So we laid out a number of options for her. We explored a gap year and she applied to four year universities at the same time, knowing also that she could go to a community college if she decided when she graduated. She now, she was accepted to three of the four schools. She's still waiting to hear from the four school, but she's already picked one that she loves and she's going to defer and take a gap year. So having that, uh, those options available to her, um, knowing how she was going to be at this point as uh, in her senior year, she was able to have those choices. So you definitely want children to have the choices available to them and then they can choose which way to go at the time when the time comes. Kristen, um, Ray Ann wants to know what's better. We get this question a lot. It's super common uh, I know um, to get a B. You know what it I is. Know it. To get a I know what the B question is. <laughs> in an honors or an AP class. Let's just say an AP class or an A in a regular class. And I'm going to answer it, which I know is quite frustrating. And it's going to be, it depends um, for people. Let's say hypothetically, it, it depends on the class. If you are, if your student is uh, really engineering focused, and they want to be an engineer. I would rather see them take the um, AP BC calculus and have a B than to not have taken uh, a highly rigorous calculus class. If your student is, um, you know, history is really their thing and their narrative is kind of going that way, I would want to see them take the higher rigor history class than if they hadn't and get and maybe get a B versus not having taken um, the highest level available. So um, that's, it's kind of just, I know it's hard, but it depends. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of questions about testing and parents ask, you know, what point should your child take a mock test? And generally kids will take them at the end of their sophomore year, the summer between their sophomore and their junior year or in the fall of their junior year. And this is really kind of like a fact finding mission to determine, you know, again, which test is best for them and to help them really plan out, all right, if your score is here and we want it to be here, how much time is it going to take? 
Um, how many sessions of support will your student need? We offer one-to-one -one help. Um, we believe that's really the best way to improve a score uh, because it's totally individualized for the student. So we take the child's baseline and we'll look where are the areas that they can improve the most. And the way you improve your score the most is not working on all the areas. It's not working on things you're already good at. It's taking the lowest areas and working specifically on those. And that's why individual help is, is really the way to go. And so um, in general, students will take the test a couple times in their junior year. Statistically speaking, students get their best score in the spring of their junior year um, for three reasons. They're older, they're more mature, and they have more curriculum under their belt. So, you know, anytime before them, then taking a practice test is a good idea. Um, and so Michelle asked, do you have to identify schools when you sign up for a mock test? And the answer is no, because you're going to take that through us. These are retired tests, extremely similar to what the kids are taking now. Um, but they don't, schools don't get this. When you sign up for a real test, you can put the schools in at that time, but you do not have to. You can go back later. Uh, let's see. Um, my daughter is taking a SAT prep course, and I did better on the S ACT than the SAT. How do I motivate her to sit for a mock ACT? I'd say if she's already in a class, I would just leave it alone. I would let her go in that direction because shifting gears at this point um, is going to take more time. It's going to take more effort. And really, you know, the name of the game is grades. Grades trump test scores any day of the week. And so we want our kids to spend um, as much time as they have, not on, you know, improving from a 24 to a 26 on the a a ACT, but instead um, working on their grades, because that's going to get them farther with admissions. Let's see. Um, I think I feel, oh, wait, here, here's a bunch of questions that I missed. Sorry about that. Let me go back to a couple of these other questions. All right. Kristen mentions the level of competition for college has been, has gotten harder each year. And our community is full of high achievers. How can a child who has struggled get into college? And Kristen, I know that you've talked about this mm -hmm. for most of the webinar, but how can you assure kids that it's going to be okay? Especially when, like you said, they're coming from this environment where it seems like everybody around them is an overachiever. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that's tough. That's really difficult um, for the student. I, I feel for them. And it's really just letting them know and help and showing them that they do have talents and unique things and contributions to make to an environment. And doing that exploration on finding those things, setting them up for success. And that is um, also seen in compiling that list. Really, that list is going to be super important, making sure that there are schools that, Matt, that are in their range and that would be most likely for them so that they will have schools. And as I said, and I can't say it enough, there truly is a school for everyone. Um, Jennifer said that, or Anne, I'm sorry, said that, asked, what is a bad grade? Like what is considered a bad grade in admissions? She said our high schooler gets A's and B's and usually a one C per semester. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I'm sure it's it's relative based on the school. Well, that's exactly it. And it's exactly what I was going to say. It depends. <laughs> There's the answer for the day. Um, what schools you're applying to? Absolutely. I mean, you can, and I hate those scattergrams that people look at, but looking at those scattergrams, you'll see that there are, depending on the school you're applying to, a 3-5 GPA could be right in the wheelhouse and where a lot of students are accepted from versus a 3-5 GPA applying to a highly selective school that has an admissions rate down in 5%. It's not, it's, it, it, you know, it doesn't bode well. That's not going to be a, a good, GP, good GPA. And I hate using the word good, but it's not going to be one that's, um, that's responsive to that school. Michelle asked, what is an average GPA these days? I don't know, Michelle, Kristen, you might, I do know that an A is the most awarded grade and there, there is a tremendous amount of grade inflation for sure. Absolutely. But, you know, th there are still um, how this is interesting, but D's and F's are still awarded 
to the same degree as they were a generation ago. So it seems mm-hmm. like what's happened is that, you know, when we were growing up, if you got a C, it was kind of average. But now a C can be, um, not always, but it can be a red flag to the school. Um, definitely it should be to the family that the student isn't quite understanding the content mm-hmm. and they do need support. Or maybe they have weak executive function skills and they do need support. But Kristen, do you know an average GPA right now? So I, I, I really, um, I'm cautious to throw out numbers because G, GPAs are not all created equal. And when um, they're really school, high school specific, when students apply to, to college, they are being compared against the students at their high school. So looking at what the highest GPA is at your school, looking at the median You can see these things on your secondary school report or the academic profile from your high school. That's those are the numbers that you should be considering and looking at. Colleges do not compare a student that goes to uh, Yorktown High School to a student that goes to St. Stephen's, St. Agnes, or a student that goes to Charlottesville High School down in Charlottesville. They're three different schools. So your student is only compared against those at their school. So you should only be focusing on the GPAs coming out of your high school. Kristen, Lynn said um, she's going on her first college tour next week and her child is meeting with a professor in the field of meteorology. And that's what her son is interested in studying. What are some questions that her son could ask? Oh, that's that's fabulous. <laughs> that's so wonderful. And it's it's amazing that your son already knows that he has a very um a very finite area of interest. That's fantastic. I think um we have a number of questions that that we give students to that they can take with them and to ask when they go on college visits and and also a worksheet that they can fill out to um put down their their impressions. So they remember it after the fact when they start looking at lots of colleges. I think just asking organically those things that come that he finds that he's interested in, you know, asking about the curriculum, asking what type of opportunities are there outside of the classroom. I would think for meteorology, it'd be kind of cool to see what kind of things they can do outside of the classroom. You know, what kind of facilities do they have um, for the students who are interested in meteorology? And then looking at those things that are more kind of the quality of life of the student, as we talked about, you know, um, things that your student likes to do outside of the classroom. Do they have those types of opportunities and facilities available for him? Those are things that I would be looking at. Kara asks, um, and Kristen, I'll, I'll take this one and then I'll kick it over to you about a college fair. How do you prepare for a college fair? And it's awesome. I'm so glad college fairs are back because this is a great way to get for kids to get their foot in the door. And so it's important that they print out their QR code. And when they go to a college, each booth that they get the college to scan their QR code. So they have the student in their database. Um, It's also helpful to ask questions that are not like, what GPA do you need? Or what SAT or ACT school score do you need? But ask specific questions about something that's unique to that college. Oh, Um, I heard that your college of business allows for study abroad, something like that, Um, something that's specific. What often happens is that you may you can ask um, to talk to this person or you may already be speaking to the person who's going to read your application. As Kristen mentioned, the reason a student from like St. Stephen, St. Agnes is not compared to a student at Madison High School is because there are obviously different schools and sometimes they're different readers too. But usually the person at the college fair in your area is gonna be the reader of your application. Um, I used to, man, that I've, or I haven't um, this year, but in the past, I did a lot of college fairs for James Madison University as a volunteer. And um, when I knew kids, my, my kids' friends that were coming, I always said, ask for the person, ask for the representative who's going to be reading your application, um, speak to that person directly, tell them it's so great to meet them, that you're applying to the school, you're applying to JMU, and then follow up with an email to that college counselor. Um, my son did this actually. And um, in fact, JMU was the first school on his list and he was waitlisted. Even though he got into all of his other schools, he was waitlisted there. And um, before the decisions came out, he was actually accepted. 
the director of admissions who was reading his application, who he had kept in touch with over email, emailed him and said, hey, I wanted to let you know, Ethan, tomorrow you're going to get your acceptance letter, but I wanted to be the first person to tell you. And so that's how using college fairs and making connections with people is really, really important. Um, you never know if you're going to be waitlisted or how that connection with that person um, may affect you when they remember you and they go to read your application. Mm -hmm. Kristen, any other thoughts on college fairs? No, no, I, I totally agree um, with everything that you said, Anne. I think sometimes college fairs can be overwhelming because there are so many schools that are there. So if you look at the list of schools that is going to be there ahead of time and maybe identify the few that you're interested in and just concentrate on going to those booths versus, you know, trying to hit every single booth. Um, if, if you already know of some schools that you're interested in, it may seem less overwhelming. And the same tips that Anne just gave um, everyone with regards to college fairs also translates to when the representatives come to your specific high school. Um, in the fall, there'll be, you can look at your guidance counselor um, at the office, at their websites, or maybe they post them in the student announcements when the colleges come to do an information session. And I would do the exact same things, the same tips that Anne says in those, those information sessions as well. Oh, and thank you, Kristen. Um, just a couple more questions. I know we have to wrap up. And Kristen asked, how do colleges view retaking a class? So a student that got a C during a year, they want to retake the test over the class over the summer. How is that viewed to colleges? Um, it, it depends. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep using that. It depends. But um, first of all, it shows initiative. It shows that the student uh, is really taking responsibility, that they want to do better. Um, so I think that's all in the positive. In terms of how it equates from a, um, uh, from a GPA factor depends on the college. Some of them view them differently. Some of them will um, totally negate the first. Some will take the two, combine them. It just depends on the school. And then our last question is about summer programs. And I know we did a whole webinar on summer programs. So it's, I know it's um, a little bit detailed and complicated, but the question is, you know, many colleges offer programs. Is this beneficial for kids to go to the school, stay overnight and participate in the program? I mean, I think it's beneficial for the, for the student as in terms of it being an enriching experience. Um, if it's an area that they're interested in, if it's a college that they're incredibly interested in, having that ability to live on campus, eat the food, walk around the, the campus, um, and meet professors, I think that can be super, super enriching. Um, summer opportunities, and I know Anne said we, you have a webinar that runs the gamut and talks about all of it. It really, they, they also run the gamut. I mean, sometimes you have students who have a lot of family responsibilities. I have a student who has to take care of her siblings in the summer. So she doesn't have the opportunity to take lots of programs. And that's okay because she's showing, she's showing something um, really incredible, a responsibility, um, a commitment in a different area. So you can do that in summer pro in, in going to colleges and staying at their summer programs. You can do that with a job. You can do that with a, with a volunteer initiative. It can, runs the gamut. I mean, really students should, should do what they're interested in and what will be, they will be an enriching experience for them. Awesome, Kristen. Thank you so much. Um, I know that we're out of time. And if I didn't get to your question, feel free to email me. Um, the parent who asked about some more programs, I can also send you a recording of that webinar. And my email is Ann, A-N-N, -N, at ectutoring.com. And I will either reply to your question or get you a resource. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. I hope that you found this to be helpful. Kristen, thank you. Um, thank and you. if you don't mind, please wait for that survey at the end. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. Wishing you all the best for the remainder of the school year.